evening. Good evening. Good evening. I am J.B. Hawley, pastor of New Vision, ministry here at Church of Shepherd, and also chaplain at the University of Michigan Hospital. The evening, the morning of August 17th, I stood on the ground in Ferguson on West Forreston, and I received the rage of that community, both conservatives and liberals, everybody sees that. And I came back to Ann Arbor <coughs> struggling with that question of what to do, what to do, what is the theological response? And I remember one of my seminary professors saying, good theology starts where you are. Mm -hmm. And so tonight, being here as moderator affords me to start right where I am. <laughs> Having said that, let me introduce to you our speakers for this evening that we are so gracious to have. And I'll introduce them one at a time. From the American Civil Liberties Union, we have with us tonight Rod Monson, Rod Mont, who is the Union Field Director. He has been the Union Field Director for four years. Please welcome Rod. Also joining us tonight is the County Sheriff, Washtenaw's County Sheriff, Jerry Clayton. He has been in law enforcement right here in Washtenaw County for 26 years and has been a twice elected sheriff uh, for a total of six years. Please welcome him. <laughs> and finally, joining us tonight is the Ann Arbor Chief of Police, John Soto. Sito, I'm sorry. I need glass. <laughs> He's been in law enforcement for a total of 24 years and has been the chief of police right here in Ann Arbor for the past two years. Please call me. <laughs> now, they will each give their speeches and uh, I will just, uh, as a word of caution, say to the audience that the last portion of tonight's event will focus on you all uh, being able to ask uh, your questions. Uh, and before we start with uh, Field Director Mott, I would just ask that you give yourselves a round of applause for <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. All right. So I was asked to talk about some lessons learned from Ferguson. And the first thing that came to mind, um, I have to tell you, like, uh, many pe people from places that are prominent in our civil rights history, things like this, always sort of strike a nerve with me. I'm originally from Little Rock, Arkansas. My family um, was very much connected to situation with uh, Little Rock Nine uh, happened back in the late 50s, including my father, who um, has always been an inspiration to me because of some things that he went through. As a teenager, my father was wrongly accused of a crime, tried, convicted, and spent almost two years of his life in prison. So my grandparents were able to get him hurt and um, moved on from that. Um, but would have loved many people carrying baggage, right, that would affect the way that they live their lives. But um, you know, my father raised me to be a person who embraced diversity and had respect for authority despite what he went through. And I always use that example um, to motivate me when I hear about things like the situation that happened with Michael Brown. Um, it does not surprise me because um, race is something that our country is going to continue to deal with. What I think these opportunities present um, is a chance for us to look at our complacency in some regards or our inaction uh -huh. and many others, right? Uh -huh. This isn't an anomaly. This isn't you know, a, a happenstance. These things take place in cities across our country all the time. Uh -huh. Does anybody here 
here familiar with the name Milton Hall? Milton Hall was a man who had some mental health challenges, who um, was involved in a confrontation with police in Saginaw back in 2012. And as a result of that uh, altercation, uh, six police officers were involved on the scene. One had a police dog. They confronted Milton as he brandished a small knife. And at one point, uh, Milton used the knife to bite the dog. At one point, he turned towards the police officers, and they shot him 47 times. The officers involved in that shooting um, were, not, uh, were not formally charged. And earlier this year, the Justice Department decided not to investigate that crime as a wrongful shooting. Um, and you can argue about the specifics, and, and I'm sure uh, my fellow panelists here will have some thoughts on how these things are handled. Um, they're better equipped and more experienced than I am. But I use an example to say this happened here in Michigan when I asked for a show of hands, not making it up. Right? Um, so we shouldn't be surprised by what happened in Ferguson, but we can use this as an opportunity to look at what's happening in our own when situations like the one involving Milton Hall happen, we're not surprised, we're motivated to do something, to address the problems that got everybody so angry in the first place. Right? The outpouring of support for Michael Brown were not just as a result of him being shot. It was a result of the frustration of people in the community have been feeling for some time. And it eventually boils over. So I had an opportunity to talk to my colleagues in Missouri about some of the things that they have been involved in as a result of that tragedy. And many of them have been um, tied to the response of the police uh, to the incident, as well as the communities uh, continued organizing around the issue. Uh, you may have you know, seen some of these images of heavy militarized police. Um, that has certainly been an issue. Uh, my colleagues at ACLU in Missouri, in fact, uh, filed a lawsuit addressing this policy, although it was not written anywhere in stone, of uh, not allowing anyone to stand around for more than five seconds. I don't know if you even heard about that, but it was to um, further suppress the community's ability to get out, um, voice their concern, and also to document what's taking place. We have a right to capture images of things that we can see in public space. <coughs> Everyone knows this, but it, it is something that um, is part of our, our rights. And as folks sought to exercise that, right, they were confronted by police. So, our Yeah, so, oh, that does make a big difference. Yeah. <laughs> now, could you hear anything I've been saying? <laughs> I can even hear my voice now. No, my mother always tells me I should try to project. I do work on it, but I just always <laughs> Um, so, a couple things have happened after, after that. One is a local uh, coalition has been formed uh, called the Don't Shoot Coalition. And there's also a national coalition called the Hands Up Coalition um, that seek to address issues around um, police interaction, police militarization, and also cultural confidence going forward. So we can address some of these underlying issues. And not only lead, in many cases, um, to tragedy, but also um, feed into this lack of understanding that pits communities against each other, and there's really no rational reason for that being. Um, my colleagues have also been involved in protecting the rights of protesters and looking at what is likely to emerge out of this. And there are really three things. One is more attention being paid to the equipment of police organizations with military um, supplies, vehicles, weapons, and so forth. Um, and also this issue of body-worn cameras, which is something that you know, the ACLU can get behind because it provides protection for both um, law enforcement officials and those folks who are involved in encounter. There are some issues with regard to some things that get accidentally reported, um, you know, that, that, that's something that we're willing to work through. Then there's this issue about the outcome of this. 
because there is great concern that the officer, the officer involved in this may not face charges. And the results of the federal investigations that have now been launched may not turn out to the community's life. And so what happens as a result of that? Um, there is some concern that there may be bias in Missouri, of course, in what we've seen, as well as in some of these other, or, sorry, these other cities where uh, or organizations have begun to pull citizens together. And that's only going to happen if we don't get back to what I was saying before. And that's look at these underlying issues that have people round up about what's going on in their community in the first place. Um, locally, we're looking at how we might better equip folks to be attentive to some of these issues before something um, explosive happens and to be more um, active in, in monitoring what's going on in our local communities. I mean, the Milton Hall shooting was captured by bystanders on cell phones and posted on YouTube. And still, the word of that has a trickle you know, across our region. Um, we're looking at maybe some opportunities to launch some technology, an app, in fact, that will allow folks to monitor interactions with uh, law enforcement, as well as to provide them information on what their rights are. Because in many cases, when involved in interactions, folks, don't, folks aren't informed enough to make appropriate, uh, to make appropriate uh, communication and, and interaction with law enforcement that leads to altercations that in some kind of, in some cases, I'm sorry, uh, have tragic consequences. Uh, with that said, uh, I don't want to go over my time. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. So I'm a pacer, so uh, I'll hold this close, but I'm going to pace. Um, at first, I was thinking, uh, there's nothing, I won't take up 10 minutes. That's what I was first thinking. I won't take up 10 minutes. But quite frankly, you're going to have to hit me with the one minute sign. <laughs> because this is extremely complex. It's extremely emotional for people. Um, and as I think about the things I want to touch on, and I know you ask questions, I was like, wow, that's more than 10 minutes worth, so let me condense it. So let me start with um, what I thought about watching Ferguson. So in a lot of national events that occur, you know, we had that active shooter in the theater in Aurora. We've had it in Sandy Hook and a bunch of other places. As a law enforcement executive, I sit back and I say, well, what would we do? In Washington County, are we prepared? In Washington County, have we taken the proactive steps to prevent these things from occurring? But in the event, and, and you know what, it doesn't matter what you do, these things may occur. So now how do you respond? And we understand that in incidents like, like, like active shooters, people are going to look to law enforcement for leadership. Quite frankly, in a situation like Ferguson, people still should look at law enforcement for leadership. Um, so I was thinking, gosh, what would we do? And then quite frankly, I had staff ask, if this happened, how would we respond? So my initial response, and I said this to staff, is, you know, we work in an environment where 24-7, 365, you are in, in situations for the potential for something like that to happen. That's what we do. This is the role we play in society. Um, so could we ever train, do all the things that we want to, to ensure that our, our officers never have to engage someone in a lethal force situation? No, I can't guarantee that will never happen. What we hope will is, is we've made the right decisions, we've treated people the right way, we've done all the things to prevent that from happening. So here's the other side. So what, ha what would you do if something like that happened? My response is, you know what, we're already doing that. So my belief is a lot of the response in the community was because there was a lack of relationship between the community and law enforcement. There was a lack of trust. There's a lack of understanding. And some of this is the obvious, but you know what? It can't be too much the obvious because we continue to fail to do it. And it's more than just having a policy that says you'll treat people with respect. It's more than just sending staff to a training for a couple of days and say, this is how you're supposed to do it. It's got to be part of your organizational culture. From a leadership standpoint, the staff have to know very clearly, here's what we accept and here's what we want to That we can provide proactive, uh, enforcement to, to the community 
without violating people's rights, without violating their dignity, without violating all the things that people expect as being citizens of the country. And here's one of the conversations we have with staff. Um, and I'll give you a little bit in terms of my background in a second. So part of the conversation we have is this, look, we all have bias, all of us. Oftentimes it's this implicit bias we're not cognizant of, and if we're not careful, those biases we have will influence the decisions that we make and the actions that we take. So part of the problem is we don't want to acknowledge the basic fact that we all carry that in us. We do. And our inability or unwillingness to engage in conversations like this allow those biases to seep into our actions because we're not cognizant. We don't ask ourselves this simple question. If this person was something else, would I do the same thing or something different? It's a simple test. If the answer is no, then you have to ask yourself, well, why am I treating this person different than that person? That's a simple test. So you have to be able to ask those questions. You have to challenge yourself along those lines. So that's part of it, that you have to make sure that, you know what, I can't write a policy that gets rid of the bias. What we can write a policy for and train to is say, this is what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Here's the other piece. How do you engage the community? So I just left Grace Fellowship Church in Ipswich Township, where they just announced, where we just announced in coordination with the TDK Foundation, uh, Internet Officials and Comcast, where they are giving 25 families access to the internet for free through Comcast and 25 laptop computers. So you may say, well, Jerry, why are you talking about that? Because it is an example of community engagement. It's an example of law enforcement getting into a community and interacting in ways that have nothing to do with law enforcement. So if I want a relationship with you, it can't just occur when something bad is happening. So we can't form a relationship when the only time we interact is when we respond to a call for service. We form a relationship by having dialogue like this in just the, my, my grandfather used to say, the just cause situations. Just cause. Just had a conversation. So there's some more I'll talk about, but I want to give you my background so you understand where I'm coming from. So I was born in Bessemer, Alabama, raised in New York, went to high school in Detroit and ended up here. <laughs> my grandfather, my parents have been together for almost 50 some years, but in the first few years, my grandfather raised me, or my parents moved up north to make me My grandfather and I were just like this. You're like, Jerry, where are you going with this? There's a reason I'm telling you this story. Just like this. So at some point, when I was finishing school, I joined the sheriff's office as a correctional officer. Came back and wore my uniform proudly. Oh yeah, by the way, my grandparents had moved up to live with my parents by then in Detroit. And I walk in with my uniform, my mom was proud, she, proud, I guess, if I was wearing any kind of uniform, that's mom's. My dad was proud. My grandfather looked at me and said, huh, oh, walk away. It's okay. What's that about? So things went on, and finally I asked my dad, what's wrong with grandpa? And my dad said, ask your grandpa. So I asked him. You know what he told me? He said, son, I told you the stories of marching with King. I told you the stories of things that were going on and police sick and dogs and all that kind of stuff. How can you betray what I just, what we went with, with what I told you? So I'm pretty snappy with stuff, but I didn't have a comeback at that time, but I thought about it. And later I came and I talked to him. I said, Grandpa, you did it from the outside in. Every now and then you gotta do it from the inside out. There has to be leadership in all organizations that are committed to the right thing. So what drives me is just that. Let's make sure that from a law enforcement perspective, we are seen as an essential partner in the community, not a necessary evil. That when people in the community call us, they're not signed and say, oh my God, I hope I get a good one. They call us and say, I know I'm going to get a good one. I know I'm going to get someone that treats me with dignity and respect. Even if you have to take someone to jail, you can treat them with dignity and respect. And I'll be very honest with you, it seems simple, but I think it starts there. I think it starts there. And the other thing is we have to ask ourselves hard questions in law enforcement and challenge ourselves to do the right thing. And I don't know how much time I have. Remember, oh, I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, there's another piece. The community has a responsibility to it. So if there's a partnership and there's a handshake, it can't just be one hand extended. It can't. So when the staff asked me, if something like this Ferguson happened up here, 
how do you think the community will respond? My response is, I hope and pray that they will give us the benefit of the doubt. That we have done enough on the front end to show that we value the people that we serve. So if something like this happened, they would take a pause and say, they may be wrong, but the Washington County Sheriff's Office and the Ann Arbor Police Department, you'll hear from the chief who's a fine law enforcement executive, they provide services the right way. So let's just see how it turns out. And we trust the fact that they're going to do their due diligence to find out what the facts are. And if the law enforcement officer has to be held accountable, we'll do that. If the citizen has to be held accountable, we'll do that. That's the only way this thing works. It's the only way it works. And I'll end with this. The other thing we talk to people about is simply this. So why, you know, and I have this, I teach uh, bias-based policing and all this stuff, so when I'm teaching law enforcement officers, they say, why is the onus on us? Why are we the ones in the train? It's very simple. As law enforcement professionals, we are charged with maintaining the societal laws, right? And we're also given the authority to do the things that no other profession in this country can do. When I talk military, I guess we'll get there at some point. No other professions do. The decisions and the actions of a law enforcement officer can take away what we value most in this, in our country. Our freedom and our life. So if my plumber is biased against me, what has he done? He doesn't sweat my pipes. I get a new plumber. If my grocer is biased against me for whatever reason, I don't go to that grocer. If my police officer is biased against me, I can't go somewhere else. So we have to trust that fact. So that's the foundation for where we work from in the sheriff's office. And I look forward to your questions and we continue the dialogue. Thank you. I suspect those were in 10 minutes, but thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll probably lead off saying the same thing that I, I may not take 10 minutes because it's, it's very important for me to hear from you. Uh, it is important for me to give you a little background on myself, just like the sheriff. It's a great pleasure to hear from you, Mr. Mons, and, and, uh, thank you, Pastor. and the Church of Good Shepherd. I have been to uh, many forums, many public discussions with the sheriff. We've uh, kind of grown up together, went to the same police academy together. <laughs> our leadership styles, I believe, and our philosophies are very similar. So you may hear some of the things that have been already repeated, or at the very least emphasized when I speak of some of these topics. A little background on myself, uh, so you kind of have experiences. I think it's good to know where we all come from. Uh, I've been with the police department 24 years, 24 and a half years, all of it in Ann Arbor here. I've been the chief for the last two and a half years. Uh, I grew up in Detroit, in the northeast side of Detroit, growing up at the tail end of the 70s and the early 80s, and during that time I had my own experiences growing up in Detroit. We were coming off the year of the, the Vietnam War and the, some of the issues with Mr. Chin, if you remember, anybody remembers that the, uh, over there, with the Japanese, all the workers, and the people So I only preface that by saying we all have our experiences. We all have understandings of how bias may uh, have affected us. Now speaking about the community meetings, since I've been chief, I don't think I've ever turned down an opportunity to come to a community meeting. I don't think I've turned down an opportunity to meet with individuals or groups of people. And the reason I do that is not necessarily for me to stand up here and talk or, or preach, it seems like a term to use here, <laughs> or to preach about what we do, although that is helpful. It is important for us as law enforcement executives to explain to you some of the things that challenges that we have, some of the things that we can do and cannot do. It's important, but what's more important is for me to hear from you and the lessons that I can learn from hearing from you. Some of the things that we talk about today that you're gonna hear from the sheriff, myself, or any speakers, uh, I hope that we agree on many things. I hope there is more uh, open dialogue, but there are gonna be some things that we may not agree on. And I think that's okay, because we have different perspectives. But the important thing is, even the things that we don't agree upon, that we have the open discussions and how we bridge that gap to draw us a little closer together. You might have the same discussions with police officers on the role of my supervisors. I may not even have the same perspectives as police officers in my department. It's because we all come with our own experiences. But as a leadership, as a sheriff, as a chief of police, these type of community engagements are important, are important to me. I encourage you to be frank. Nothing's gonna offend us. The sheriff and I have been to many meetings. I was at a, uh, another impact forum earlier today. It really does take that open dialogue. Um, that's how we move forward. I'll give you a quick example. Um, I was at a meeting with uh, some University of Michigan students. Um, it was a black student union. 
I was there with some police uh, officers from University of Police as well as University of Michigan representatives. And the discussion that we had there in that setting with the, with the great young people turned my perspective in what I need to do as a police here's chief. Here's an example. The sheriff and I are going to speak that we have great men and women working in the police department. I'll stand behind that all day. Are we perfect? Not, not. We're not perfect. But there's great people here working. We're a great department. My gauge of what I needed to do as a police chief had been that these types of incidents that we hear in other parts of the country, in Saginaw, has not happened here in Ann Arbor or Washington County. My gauge used to be that has not happened. You know, it may not happen. It, it could, but it likely not happen. And the gauge was, hey, we're doing okay. And from the discussions I had with this group of students being very frank with me, I changed my bar of what we need to do. No longer is my bar as a police chief, as a sheriff, that things have not happened in the past. Our bar must be that every people that we serve in this community, every person in this community, is free from fear and belief that that can happen to them in this community. And I don't think we're there yet. I think there is a belief that that can happen. So my point in this story is, every one of these meetings, I go home and I reflect, and I, and I, I lay, lay it up at night. Somebody's here that can probably attest to that. <laughs> but it's a good opportunity for me to do that, because we learn from those things. And I was astounded, you know, and, and we go into the perceptions of what we're doing well, and we turn around. That's not what we're doing. Once again, I'll repeat that. It's not what has not happened or what may or may not happen. It's to be free from the fear and the belief that it may happen. That's how we work. That's what we need to work toward. And how do we do that? This is the first step. These types of engagements, these types of open dialogues. Does it end here? Absolutely not. The sheriff and I have always spoken to, we go to a lot of these meetings. It doesn't, it's not about us. It's kind of about all of our supervisors and all of our officers. A quick story about community engagement uh, and some of the lessons learned. Uh, we've been very active in community engagement. We've tried to bring that back. We have a community engagement unit. We have a sergeant and two officers. Their responsibility is to go out to these meetings and engage the community. But we have said it's not just their responsibility. They don't work 24-7. They're not here all the time. It's everybody's responsibility, all the supervisors and officers. So uh, I, I apologize. I told the story earlier today. We assigned somebody to go to a, uh, 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 an event with the youth. And we assigned the officer, and we think we're doing the right thing. We've been, we're engaging community. We send somebody to be at this youth activity. I get feedback a couple days later that this officer just sat in the car. Just sat in the car and watched. And the perception that was perceived by the community and the youth there is he's just watching us, waiting for us to make a mistake, waiting for us to do something. And when I hear that, I, my next reaction is not, I'm not mad at the officer. My that first reaction is, what did I do wrong? Well, how did that message get across? Community engagement is engaging the community. It's not, we have enough community engagement with police officers in the car. We need to engage outside of the car. And once again, I say that in jest sort of because it's easier said than done sometimes. Because we lose focus on some of the things that we do and all of the responsibilities we have as police officers outside of the engagement. All the, it's a hard job. These officers have a hard job and have to do a lot of things. We as chiefs and executives have to balance all the, the needs of the community. There are a lot. I get a lot of phone calls, and I have council members here to attest to. We have a lot of needs. I know we have more discussions, but I do want to touch a little bit about, because I was asked to reflect about Ferguson. Um, I, I will say that when I was thinking about it, I was a little sheepish about discussing that, because um, I didn't have all the details. I was not there, as the pastor was. However, as a police chief, and I was sure most police chiefs in the country, you cannot watch that without bringing it back to your own community and understanding what could happen, what you need to do. And without discussing the specifics there, I'll talk about Ann Arbor, Washington County, and two things I took away from that. And Sheriff stole my thunder on the first part of it. <laughs> the community trust has to be earned before the incident occurs. It is, it is too late when, it, when it's happening. And that's why we do these. That's why we're diligent to come out all of these things, and that's why we want to speak to that's the first thing. And that's what about the community engagement unit. But we have to do it right. Second thing is, when you look at that, our departments, the sheriff's department, every county, every department in the county has, has, uh, has been reduced in size. Incidents, major incidents, we cannot handle them by ourselves. We cannot handle them. We have to rely on the sheriff's department, Ypsilanti Police, all of those departments. That's why we talk about training. We'll talk about that. But that comes with the price. That comes with our responsibility to make sure every officer that may come into Ann Arbor or the Washington County is on the same page 
about how we respond to incidents and that we're all in the same training. And that does start with the leadership, the commitment to make sure all of the training is consistent with the officers. And it goes into briefing before the instance. All the supervisors know the expectations and know what we can and cannot do and what is and is not acceptable in Ann Arbor and in the community. I have the same uh, responsibility if I go uh, assist another one. So those are kind of the two overview things that I learned from watching some of those things without speaking specifically about it, but more so relating back to those nights that I stayed up wondering, what, what, what lessons can we learn? What can we do better? And you know, the answer is always, it's always like, oh, we're doing okay, but we can do more. And how we do it, how we achieve that, starts with these types of executive discussions. So I, I look forward to, uh, you know, I've got a lot more thoughts still on my mind and some of the questions, but let's, let's hear from, uh, from Thank you. Thank you. So before we open it up for, 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 for questions, let me just announce that there's a microphone right in the middle of the, the aisle there. I would ask that you all would be brief with your questions, but because I have a little privilege, I'm going to throw my question out <laughs> ahead of you all. Uh, and, in terms of being less abstract, maybe my question is not so much can Ferguson happen here. My question is, is, is Ferguson happening here? Um, is there anyone, uh, and, that, and this is the item, is there anyone who is currently on an active daily basis running the analysis of disparities in terms of police stops and searches and arrests and, and that type of thing? This, this is, this is um, as they say, the numbers don't lie. So I'd be curious to know what, uh, uh, what, what, what that looks like. And then the, the, the second part of that question, which is really a, probably the second question, is, uh, <laughs> And I've been waiting to ask this for two years. Um, when I first moved here two years ago, I heard about this event called Hash Bash. Uh, and, uh, and I was floored. I, I was floored. And I must say, I, I, and I thought about that even on the way back from Ferguson, I was listening to the radio. And they made it, they, they, that's when they released that Mike Brown had marijuana in his system. And, and I thought, well, how ironic is that? They, they haven't been able to count how many bullet holes are in his body yet, but we know, how, we know he has marijuana in his system. Um, and it just makes me think of, 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 of the disparity in terms of that. And I talked to my, some of my colleagues who, were just, who hadn't even considered uh, yeah. the illegal aspect of hash bash. And, 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 uh, and I wanted to just have either of you all addressed that because the word on the street is, the word on the street is, is that officers actually look the other way um, and uh, while this happens. And it's been happening for 40 years. Hash Bash has a website, they have a Twitter page and a Facebook page. <laughs> uh, and uh, and it, it's a big smoke fan. I, I hope I don't offend anybody. You know. <laughs> and we'll with you. But I do want, want to see if you all had a response to, to, to that and to bring some. I made a deal with the sheriff, but he doesn't know what the deal is, so. <laughs> I'll respond to the hash bash if he covers a thing about the, uh, the racial disparities in studies, because he, I was actually trained by the sheriff when he did the bias training. I, I was in his classes. I, I've been in those classes. So he is the expert in that area. What hash bash. I, that would have been the, that's probably the last question I thought I would have to answer. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and I ask that question because I've seen communities of color be ravaged because of marijuana. Right. Yeah. A little bit about the history of, 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 of marijuana in the city. Um, I've grown up, that didn't, that didn't sound right, man. let me rephrase that. I've grown, up in the, I've grown up in the police department here and about the, uh, the marijuana. In the city, the city ordinance dictates that marijuana is, is, is in essence, decriminalized. It's a civil infraction. That is, that is that is through city ordinance. Uh, so if you can see the, the enforcement of marijuana, of, of uh, how do I say it, like the hash hash, casual use, I will be the first to admit that is not the priority, that's not the top priority. When you see hash hash, interestingly though, it, occur, it occurs on the Diag, uh, Police Department's uh, jurisdiction. They do not abide by the, they, they don't abide by the city ordinance, they go by state law, which is a misdemeanor. 
So there's there's options. As police officers in Ann Arbor, one of the discretions and one of the things that we always have to do is use our discretion and best judgment in how we enforce those. Generally speaking, about a, almost almost 100% of the time, marijuana enforcement is in the, under the city ordinance for civil infraction. Because as a police officer, as a police chief, through the through the adoption of city ordinances, that's what we've been giving guidance on what how that should be handled in that area. I can't speak to other communities as far as how that's handled in marijuana. Most places, it's a crime, it's a misdemeanor. Having said that, we, we do we treat everybody the same having uh, marijuana. So that's uh, that's the, that's a little bit of the history. If we are obligated by city ordinance of how we enforce uh, marijuana violations. Okay. Um, so, sure. Some deal, chief. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's a fair it's a fair it's a fair trade off. So. I said before I tell you a little bit more about my background, and I knew the opportunity would present itself. So um, I do a lot of work in the area of bias-based policing. So I am not an active partner, but I'm a partner in a law firm. I mean, in a firm called Lambert Consulting. So that's what we do. We do statistical analysis of traffic stops, pedestrian contacts, all that kind of stuff. But we also do a training component and a community engagement component. Because just having the numbers is just the first piece. Uh, we talk about you can't manage what you don't measure, so you have to measure and stuff. So specific to this area, uh, actually Lambert Consulting did the study for the city of Ann Arbor uh, when Chief Dan Oates was here. Actually, it was before Dan, and Dan came in. Who was the chief? Chief Right. Uh, so I, I can't remember how many years ago that was. Late 90s. Uh, and when and, and you can have access to that, I think if you go to the LambertConsulting.com, that report may be on the website. And actually what it showed, and I won't take you through the science because I would be more than 10 minutes, but at the end of the day, we're really trying to compare the traveling population versus the population of people being stopped. Not census, because census only tells you who lives. It doesn't tell you who travels. So if you just do census, you're gonna have skewed results. So we do the traveling population. And you have to break it down time of day because you know the traveling population changes. You got a different population in the morning than you do in the evening because people come and go to work, school, different on the weekends than during the day. So you have to break all that down and then make a direct comparison. And I, again, I said I won't go deep into it. So the point is when we did the Ann Arbor statistics, it did not show uh, a disparity for African Americans in terms of traffic stops versus who's traveling. Um, you're challenging my memory here. I think there may have been one or two areas where there may have been a slight disparity in Hispanics, but I'm not sure. I, I cannot remember. Washington County, um, I started doing the work and I met John Lambert because we did the first urban-based study in Washington County. It was done with the Sheriff's Office. And that was done in the late 90s uh, under Sheriff uh, Scheibel. So that result, those results came out, and it actually showed a significant disparity in traffic stops versus the traveling population in certain key parts of Washington County. And the plan at that time was for us to do the training, to continue to collect and analyze the data, uh, and then we would measure whether that has changed. Um, Ron Scheibel, if you all remember, lost. Dan Minzy became sheriff. And I still stayed, I got bumped down, I still stayed, and he immediately stopped the data collection and the work that we were doing. Now, since I've been in office, we have done some preliminary stuff, but quite frankly, what we will have to do, because the benchmarks are, have about a 10-year life cycle, because things change. Uh, here's the challenge that I have, I'll be very honest with you. We do everything else, we do training, engagement, but actually collecting the numbers right now, because there's only one methodology that has been tried and tested in court and has survived, and it's the one that my partner uses, I cannot hire him. I'm telling you, I can't hire him because it will be a conflict of interest for me. So I'm still trying to figure out how do we bring somebody in that actually employs that methodology to do a new study. So absent that, I can't do it myself. I mean, I could, but I got other things to do. I mean, it really is a major, major addition. So we're trying to do some other things, and I think at some point we'll get to the point where we'll start collecting those data again. Um, so that's where that's what's happening in Washington County in terms of data collection. Thank you. Real quick to follow up on that, um, 
The sheriff's absolutely correct. That's one of those things that is complicated. We do still keep the statistics. Uh, we are still required. All of our traffic stops, just like the sheriff has, uh, has continued to do now, we do have the data. It's the analyzing of the data, which is a challenge. Not an excuse, just a challenge. Questions on the floor? Please step to the mic. Please keep the questions brief as many questions as possible, please. Hello. Hi, thanks so much. I really appreciate you being here tonight. Um, I was just wondering if you could perhaps both follow up on that last point about data. Um, I just graduated from the University of Michigan with my PhD in criminal justice, and there are thousands of researchers in this state, many of them very capable of doing this kind of analysis. There are researchers all over the country. I've been involved in that type of analysis for the last 10 years. So can you speak a little more to why it is that you can't find somebody? I understand there's one specific methodology you're talking about, but there are, are many methods that can be used. So I'd be curious to hear more. Thank you. Well, I'll speak from my perspective, because I only trust the methodology. So if there's a research, and I've reached out to several that won't employ that methodology because they have what they think is a better way. So I'm just telling you from my perspective, I've been there, done it. We've done it all over the country, and we've done it in Europe. And every time it's been challenged, it's been seen as valid. And there's no other methodology in this country that's been done relative to this subject that has been challenged in court and survived. So you're right, I guess I could try to bring somebody in, bring John in to teach him. I still got to pay John. Uh, he, he's a businessman. So the point is, I think we'll move in that direction and we'll collect the data. You're right, there's 100 researchers. I've gone to many of the, of the conferences where different researchers have talked about what well, we can use crash data, we can uh, use pull and push data, we can use all the different kind of data to determine the traveling population. And I will argue there's only one way to determine the traveling population, and that is to go out and observe and collect those data, stratify it in an appropriate way, and make the appropriate comparison. So I, I, your point is right. There are tons of statisticians and experts out there, but I only know of one that I trust to move forward. Maybe we could talk more about that. Maybe. <laughs> right. Maybe. Uh, good evening. All right. First of all, I want to say that I have the highest respect for you as a policeman. It's a job I wouldn't have. You have the hardest job in the world. And uh, we should give you uh, My question, um, you both talk about community, community relations and engaging the community. And um, in a perfect world, I would think that in community in, in, in uh, Ferguson, if the police officer and the young man had known each other's name, that probably would not have happened. Um, so my question is, uh, relative to community relations, the both of you, uh, what are three things that you're doing, either as a result of this, or based on your zeal to improve community relations, what are three things that you're doing um, to improve that, or the three uh, tasks that you have that, you, that you're doing, and the other, with regard to community engagement, um, you related that to meetings, but what kind of community engagement are you doing on the street uh, with regard to folks to uh, have people familiarize, you know, more familiar with the police and have a better relationship? Thank you. Uh, very good question. I, I will uh, I'll go first and hopefully the sheriff can back me up here. Um, things here. It is a progression of how we do things. Um, once again, when we look at the history of the staffing of the police department and sheriff's department, um, some of our ability to do some of the things the way we want to do it um, has been challenging because of our staffing. Back in the mid-90s, we had almost 200 police officers. We had a own community community oriented policing division with the deputy chief and lieutenant, and we had community officers in several neighborhoods. The housing commission, the, the west side neighborhood, the south side, the old Arbor Oak or Stony Brook. We had officers that that was their only responsibility was to be in those neighborhoods and get to know the names. Not only be at the meetings, but get to be in there. They were all bike trained, they were all in, but I think some of them, we, we didn't even give them a car because we didn't want to be in the car. They had to do those things. But what has happened is through the reduction of some of the staffing, once again, I'm not here to talk about, to preach about the challenges we have in staffing, but that's a reality. If we had more officers, we can do that. 
uh, Council Member Warpowski is here. In some of the, uh, in the last fiscal year budget, uh, the council was gracious enough to, to increase the staffing level in the NR Police Department by three officers. And in response, where, what do we need in the community? Two of them went to the community engagement unit, and one of them went to traffic enforcement, which we can talk a little bit more about later. <laughs> but it's a progression, that's a step, that's the first thing we need to do. The community engagement unit is not just about in the downtown beach. You'll hear a lot about that. You think the community engagement is walking the beach downtown, that's only a part of it. One of the things that I kind of talked to about uh, council members and my philosophy, it's, it's three-pronged, it's very important. We need the vibrant downtown, don't get me wrong. We need the safe neighborhoods, and we need the outreach to the youth. The thing that I'm most concerned about, probably the part that I feel like we're probably lacking the most, is the outreach to the youth. I'm not ashamed to say that because it's reality. We don't have the school officers in the uh, school liaison officers in the schools anymore. That was a contracted issue. Everybody's facing budgets, not blaming anybody. We don't have the school officers in there. Community engagement unit is tasked with going into the school, so they're back in there working with Safety Town, very young kids. We're back in there at the at the schools at Ellicott. However, it's not consistent like when we had the officers. If I had more officers, that would be one of the first places I go to is getting back into the schools as well as into these neighborhoods. So there'd be inspection. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to continue to grow that. The problem that I face and I've seen through experience is when you have regular patrol officers doing some of those, it's an okay job, but it doesn't get to know the name of that person. They're not gonna get to know the name unless there's a consistent presence in those areas. So that's what we're working toward. But the other part of it I really want to talk about is trying to get back into school. And as, as we talk about schools, one of the concerning things that I have that I hear a lot after talking to, to school liaison officers that were in high school, their advice to me is, Chief, if you get back, if you get officers back into school, get into the middle school. And, and it, it kind of it kind of threw me back a little bit. Get into the middle school says, yes, that's what we need to. Sometimes in high school it might be a little late. We need to get them into the middle schools. So those are, that's one step. We're gonna, I, I think I mentioned a couple. Build the community engagement, get back into the schools, and have that consistency with being in the neighborhoods. Um, and, and I'll think of a couple others. I'll hand it over to Sheriff, and I think it's something I'll come back up. Okay. Uh, so when I took office, one of the first things I did was um, create a high-level executive position in the Sheriff's Office called Community Engagement, the Director of Community Engagement. Some of you know Derek Jackson. So Derek Jackson doesn't have a police background, Derek Jackson has a social work background. And we brought Derek in, and the appeal to Derek was, Derek, create, uh, help us create a philosophy where we are, again, a part of the community. Help us understand how we make a connection in the community, how we add value in the community. So Derek has his own staff. We started what's called an outreach team. So within the outreach team are ex-offenders. So one of the first things we did is we brought in one of our more serious ex-offenders that had been in federal prison that 15 years ago our staff had chased and arrested and was part of a RICO case that put him away in prison and brought him in and made him part of Sheriff's Office. And he worked with us back into the same community he helped tear down. So one of the things Derek taught me is if you give people an opportunity, if they help tear down a community to be a part of building it back up, you help them set up for the future. Now, this person has left us. He is now working full time. He started another business success story. We have a few more of those success stories. But we had another ex-offender female. Now she's working in the county. So you start very slowly changing your brand. So it's really about branding for us. It's really about when people think about, hmm, who should we bring into this conversation about making our community better? I want them to say, oh yeah, sure something. So here's an, I'll give you another example. When Willow Run and MC Schools merged the YCS, the Sheriff's Office was int intimately involved in that. Whether we agree with the merger or not, it's the reality. And the reality is we gotta make it work. So the Sheriff's Office had, and my, my, my executive assistant, Kathy Wise back there, some of you know her. She's everywhere trying to find opportunities to get us engaged in the community. Look, we go to some of our most challenging areas. We help support health fairs in those areas. We help support food distribution in those areas. We partner with athletic events in the summer in those areas. Uh, I, one of the ones, the most recent one in our newsletter that warms my heart is we have an east side location that was at one point, a lot of crime, kids would not go outside. It's the sum this summer, kids are outside, and we have uniform deputies playing kickball with six and seven year olds. That's how you do it. That's how you change the dynamic. One relationship at a time, 
one deputy, one person at a time. Look, we didn't get like this overnight. We won't get to, we won't get right overnight. But you have to be steadfast in the community. In the, in the community. Uh, and school resource officers, and I'll touch on this real quick because the chief brought up. Everybody cringes when we say school resource officers because they think it's all about enforcement. Not necessary. Not necessary. Police officers have a role. But if they're also taught that your, your other role is to help coach and mentor those kids so they never get to the point where you have to take enforcement action, they can be a very beneficial, beneficial resource. And I will say this last piece. Chief's right. You do have to get into middle schools. And we need to change the dynamic when a kid in middle school sees a police officer and runs the other way. When a parent tells a, uh, a kid, this kid, a guy's going to arrest you. Every time I'm in uniform and a parent says, I says, no, I'm not. So I'm your friend. I want to help serve you. So it sounds preachy, but I'm telling you right now, that's how you start changing that dynamic. Can we say the interest of time, I'm going to ask that you direct your question towards one of the, one of the speakers so that everyone doesn't need to answer the same question so we get more questions there, okay? Okay. Um, okay, just a quick follow-up on that question, and then I have a question about the militarization of the police. Uh, the follow-up is, what and I guess I have to address it to somebody, so I'll pick um, the Washtenaw County Chief. Um, what mechanism does the community have to provide feedback to the police force, um, especially knowing that whatever we say might be used against us in the court of law? Is that it? Well, that's that question. Just remember that one. And then let me just go ahead and ask, ask the other one about the militarization of the police. So um, it's, it appears, I think, to most people that Washtenaw County might be one of the least militarized or just hasn't been militarized. But I would like to know what level of militarization do we have? What equipment? What are the plans? Um, we've heard that. Um, you have to use the equipment or lose it, and is the police force willing to lose it because they're not using it? Just address the militarization of the police, and I guess I'll we'll address that to we the answer. I'll, I'll give the, the, the militarization one, and then the sheriff can follow up as, as that was directed, as far as the feedback of what you can do. Um, uh, the, 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 the trouble that I have uh, that I thought quite a bit about as far as what people say militarization of, of police departments. Um, that definition is somewhat vague to me, to be quite honest, because my interpretation of this militarization may be a little different than yours. We, we certainly, certainly the extremes we can agree, that's the military. Uh, as far as what we have in Washington, I appreciate you stating that fact about we're probably, you know, maybe one of the ones that are least militarized. One thing that I will emphasize about the militarization, it's not just about the equipment. It's about the police tactics and the philosophy in which they are deployed. I think that's important because some of the things that you may be perceived as militaristic and as military style may have a very worthwhile purpose if deployed under good leadership and direction and control. And, I th and that's obviously going to lead to the next question. How do you do that? You know, and, but uh, one thing that always comes up uh, when we talk about militarizations, if you see some of the articles about Washington County, uh, both the sheriff and I have some tactical background on, on the teams. Two things come to mind. One is the armored vehicle. The armored vehicle that the Washtenaw County uh, Metro team has is a civilian armored vehicle. It does not have offensive uh, capabilities. It's armored to protect the officers and citizens. So it is an armored vehicle. So many people may think because it's armored, it's militarized. It's, it's, it's produced by a civilian firm. It's, it's designed and, and sold specifically to the police department. That's the first item. Uh, the second one is probably very high profile as far as rifles, patrol rifles. If you think about the, the, uh, the evolution of police rifles, they, they, what they really, what police rifles did was really um, replace a shotgun. And some experts will tell you it's probably safer than shotguns because you are not shooting nine bullets as opposed to one. However, perception and image is intimidating. The point I'll make about that, when you see a, a patrol rifle in a police car, that weapon, although it looks militaristic, is nothing different than any citizen can purchase on their own. So those are the two things that I, I, I want to point out. Outside of the, the uniform and the way they look sometimes, um, that's outside. It's about the, 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 the vehicle and, and the weapon. So I hope that helps a little bit. We can add on that. OK. Um, so I'll be 50 in a couple of days, so I forgot your question. 
<laughs> it's what, what, how can the community provide feedback to police officers knowing that what they say might be used against them in the court of law? How could I forget that last part of that question? <laughs> um, so all of us have a mechanism for filing formal complaints. We tried to make them streamlined because you get feedback. Well, it's so complex. It's like you guys build in so many obstacles that I can never get the complaint. It's pretty straightforward. I believe you can hit us online. Can, can you do a complaint online? I'm not real sure. I'll let the chief speak to this. But you can hit us online. You can call us directly. Look, I get a lot of complaints. Well, not a lot. But the, so many times we get complaints, go right to Kathy. So I think it's all over. They shouldn't get paid to enough. And we have a law enforcement community advisory board. So I was just talking in the back. Um, they're a board, they meet every couple of months, I think, and they are like bored to death because they're not getting a lot of information. So, and I'm not saying they don't get it. I think they don't get it because we're doing a good job. But you know what, we also have neighborhood watch. So we're in all these communities neighborhood watch. I go to some of them. We have supervisors go to some of them. And it is a form that if you got service that did not meet your expectations, you can forward a complaint right then and there. So, and I'll just put this out there. If you know of a better way for us to put something in place so you can forward your concerns, please give them to us and we'll try to, to include them in our process. Thank you. Next Hi, Sharon. Um, the county actually has a lot more equipment than just that militarized vehicle and a couple of shotguns. It has quite a bit more. So what I'm wondering is, given that nationally 80% of the time SWAT teams are used just to serve warrants, usually for drug offenses, and the remaining time is where we would probably say it's actually needed, for instance, an active shooter or a hostage situation, what are the stats here in Washington County? Uh, so I guess I would, what stats? What stats are you talking about? To what extent is the SWAT team used for situations like an active shooter, which I think we can all agree is the intent of it, versus, say, serving a warrant on a civilian who doesn't even have a gun? So two things. Actually, the intent of SWAT teams have been oftentimes where a regular patrol officer or officers do not have the equipment based on our assessment of the situation to safely resolve the situations, sometimes you bring in a tactical team. So the chief uh, referenced both his and I experience. So we were both on our SWAT teams for 10 years. Let, let's do a couple things. You know, one time, Washington County had four SWAT teams. Washington County doesn't need four SWAT teams. Washington County has one SWAT team for the entire county. Washington County also has a very strict protocol in terms of when we employ. And there are some very specific criteria that has to be met before a SWAT team is employed. So if we're serving a warrant, which is, so warrants are served many times throughout the week, throughout the month. Very rarely is a SWAT team employed to serve the warrant. The SWAT team would be employed in Washington County to serve a warrant if we have credible information that the occupants inside the dwelling are known to have uh, firearms or are known to be violent in the past. Uh, then we'll do an assessment, then even then we'll do an assessment. Because at the end of the day, if we're really trying to serve a warrant, all we want to do is serve a warrant. Get the person out and say, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by all the other equipment that we have in Washington County, but I'll just echo what the chief says. It's not the equipment that you have. It's how you choose to deploy it. So there are organizations that don't have any of the stuff, but you would question their tactics around how they deal with people. So my concern with this whole concept of how militarized the, the police have become is that we're missing the point. The question is, challenge us or question our decisions about when we employ that equipment. And my response in Washington County is, tell me if you think we over deploy our equipment. People rarely see any of that stuff because we rarely use it. And if we use it, I guarantee you we can defend with very specific criteria why we choose to deploy the equipment. Those numbers, and not necessarily right now with you, but would they be available? Sure, we can get that. One, very, one, second, one minute. Mm -hmm. Just the one thing, just to kind of re re uh, reassure the people uh, the sheriff and I, and all the other chiefs that participate on the Metro SWAT uh, team, after every incident, we get an after action report. 
I, I just read one recently, and that's really the first thing I look at with the warrant services, did we locate a weapon? And I would say probably just about every time they do locate a weapon because there's credible information there is. So we do have oversight from, the, from not only in how it's employed, activated, but also afterwards as well. Hi, so I had a, a sort of related question for the Sheriff. Um, you're talking about this process that um, you go through for before you deploy the SWAT team. Who is in charge of that process? When you go to get the warrant from the judge, do you tell the judge, and we want to deploy the SWAT, SWAT team, and the judge approves that, or do you approve that personally, or who does that? Very good question. No, we do not seek guidance from mm -hmm. the judge in terms of if, or whether or not we're going to deploy SWAT team. So we have SWAT team commanders. SWAT team commanders that are very, that, that understand, that come directly from all the chiefs when we would deploy. And again, there's very specific criteria. So it has to meet that criteria. I'll, add, I'll give you an example. A couple months ago, there was a discussion about deploying a SWAT team. My undersheriff, who was like the, the deputy chief version for, for John, uh, was in the room and he says, why again are we deploying a SWAT team? And he made the SWAT commander articulate very clearly why they would deploy the SWAT team. What the risk, so here's the risk you gotta balance. What's the risk of not deploying the SWAT team? Because there have been times where teams have tried to go into houses, have been outgunned, and now you've allowed the situation to get away from that dwelling. Now it's expanded, now you're putting the community at risk. So honestly, our concern is whatever enforcement action we're trying to take, we need to do it the safest we can with the lowest level of force that is reasonable given the circumstances and the information that's available to us. So I'm wondering, one of the things that was quite disturbing to me, particularly about Ferguson and Officer Wilson, was that there was not even a police report filed. Uh, so I'm wondering if that for you all, if here in Washington County, is a police report, particularly when somebody has been gunned down, is that a mandatory uh, uh, procedure uh, or is it option? Uh, and uh, I'm wondering, Director Motz, how do you, um, uh, how do you get involved when these matters happen, uh, such as the tanks and, and all, of, all of this? First of all, I want to hear one of them say yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> real, real quickly, I'll give you a uh, I think uh, the one part that you may find some comfort in, I think the sheriff would agree. I think in our Washington County Sheriff, we're probably at the other extreme of paper heavy. We have to file a review of use of force report, and every use of force, not only if somebody is gunned down, every time that weapon is drawn, whether it's fired or not, and I can't remember the last time we actually fired a weapon. Uh, we've been shot at, but we haven't fired. But every time a weapon is displayed, every time I grab onto somebody's arm, or an officer grabs somebody's arm, or every time somebody uses any type of force, it's, it's called resistance, we file a report and it's reviewed by the deputy chief level. We file all those reports. So I think we're on the other extreme of, of, uh, of the things that we have to do. Thank you. Uh, a lot of the work that we do is driven by complaints we get about civil rights or civil liberties abuses. And we, again, uh, an investigation that often requires us to file Freedom of Information Act requests to get there so that we can make an analysis. And a lot of times that leads to uh, further investigation and interactions or engagements with a lot of cases that's happened with the police as a matter of fact. Um, you may have heard recently we um, actually released a report on some data we gathered in the Ferndale area as a result of complaints we got about racial profiling of motorists. We found that 6% of the tickets issued in this area were going to black motorists, although they only constituted 10% of the residents in that area. It's not a direct indictment, uh, but it is uh, reasonable enough reason to look deeper and who exactly is being stopped and why they're being stopped. If there is, in fact, an issue that can be documented, where are we going to do it? And a lot of the work that we do comes as a result of that. Um, the sheriff and I were talking earlier about some work that uh, he has been involved in, we have been involved in the Kalamazoo area that came about for very much the same reason. Um, while I do have the mics, I haven't had it in a while. <laughs> I do want to, um, address something that uh, the chief said relative to community policing because I, I do agree that the only way we're going to improve relations between folks and communities and law enforcement is that we see in communities law enforcement 
in engagements that don't require automatic weapons or uh, military style apparel, right? You have to be there to establish the relationships. I think that um, has been one of the issues that has played into the, the outpouring of folks who are railing against police in Ferguson. You have people in communities who uh, are unhappy for a number of reasons, right? Whether it's racism or poverty or unemployment, and when you have folks there um, in military um, armaments, with military armaments and military dress to respond to what you are feeling as a tragedy, you are outraged and you act out. Um, when it comes to police and schools, I'm not sure, I think that's one of those things we would disagree. Because our position is that police and schools lead to more referrals to law enforcement and arrests. And from data that we have collected, those happen at a disproportionate rate, particularly when it comes to students of color. That's one of the reasons that we were uh, working with our schools and other school districts across the state to and get police out of schools. Um, my point is that from data that has been collected, and there hasn't been any, um, any uh, consistent collection of data on the local level, but on a national level, we've seen data collected on law enforcement referrals and arrests and those referrals and arrests are disproportionately, um, those referrals and arrests disproportionately involve students of color and black students mm -hmm. specifically, which is one of the reasons we don't um, believe that we should have more police in schools. We believe we should have a few, we should have more social workers and more counselors in schools um, to handle those issues that cause kids uh, to get in trouble. Thank you. Sure. Questions? My question is for Chief Cito, and Chief, I'd like to know what defensive perimeter that you train your officers to maintain between a potential suspect and themselves uh, if he has a potential weapon in their hand, and if you could explain how that works. Yes, I think I Um, I think I understand your question as far as, as, far as uh, some of the tactics that we deploy. Without getting into specifics, there's always a, a perimeter or a distance which we train officers to be safe, right? And I don't want to pull any of the specifics, but it's, it's, we've done training ourselves that we can say the gap can be closed very quickly depending on the type of weapon, if it's an edge weapon. Um, so we do train that there is a greater concern when people are closer if there is a weapon, right? One example that I think that may point out the fact that we do have good training and good restraint is back in late September, I don't know if anybody read the article in, the, in the city of Ann Arbor where two officers rolled upon a, a person wielding a sword uh, against somebody. And when the officers confronted them, the person with the sword started swinging and charging at the officers. I read the police report, I spoke with the officers, and that was very close to be a very tragic incident. And from all accounts, from what I've read, and that it, sadly, it may have been, it would have been justified, but we had to restrain because of the training. So there is distance that we cover. Um, I'll give you just a general specific. If there's an edge weapon, it's usually at 21 feet. However, there's things that we can do. We teach tactics. We don't say black and white, 21 feet, this is always, I got a chair between me, I can get you, you can get a lot closer because it's a barrier. So it really depends on the variables of all the factors. We don't want to just say, if this happens, you should defend yourself. You just understand that when a police officer says, show me your hands, and I'm in the dark, and I'm standing here, and I, I need to kind of know how he's going to, where he's been trained, what he's thinking, and I know I'm, I'm I know I'm going to move fast. Yeah. We understand the purpose of the question. The train. Thank you. Let's move to the next question. We have 10, 12 minutes. I really want to get through the line. I said you short your question as much as you can, short your answer as much as you can. <laughs> <laughs> all starting to sound like preachers. <laughs> uh, Mr. Sheriff Clayton, three, three part question. Uh, and, uh, the, city and the, the city and the county both uh, get federal money from the Department of Justice and Homeland Security to buy equipment. And there is a mandated, uh, uh, it's mandated to have public engagement. The uh, guidance also tells the agencies how to avoid public engagement. It's astonishing. Um, the second thing is that. What's the question? Uh, um, should, when, when is the next cycle for that federal money to come through and what are the opportunities to have that? Um, uh, when is the next cycle to the come through? Ne the next, please let me finish. 
the, the Sheriff Clayton and um, Representative Rutledge and Bill and, and uh, Mike Ford recently met to talk about putting uh, law enforcement on the transit buses um, on the eastern part of the county. And the question is, uh, why? Um, and finally, with the marijuana question, the reality is if you're a young black man in, uh, on MacArthur Boulevard, uh, you're going to end up uh, with a felony record and a uh, bench warrant. And if you're a young University of Michigan student, uh, you're going to move to Colorado and become an entrepreneur. Maybe. Amen to that. Yeah. Okay. Right. So two okay. things really, really quick. I'm not really sure what, what federal uh, law you're talking about. We're not mandated to take federal dollars and, and equipment from the Fed, so I, I'm not. The Department of Justice block grants. Yeah, you have to you have to put in for those. So we're not mandated to take them. You have to put in for them, and we don't pursue a lot of block grants. Uh, that's the first thing. I think your second one was. Buses. Relating to the transit, but to put oh, law enforcement. Oh, uh, yeah, we met. We met as part of the Eastern Washington Safety Alliance. So part of the conversation with the then CEO of AATA was really around security enhancements for that area. So we talked about a number of different options. Whether you should put cameras there, does it make sense to put police officers on, all on the transit? So we just had a conversation. Nobody talked about or made a commitment to do that. And I, and I can't remember. Great questions, thank you. Next question. Hi, um, I never quite know what I'm gonna say. <laughs> Uh, but the first thing, I will get to a question. The first thing, though, I think that it's true that the, um, the representatives of our uh, uh, police departments have, have put their finger right on it. It's the trust that um, the community has in the police, and that's um, really important to build that, and I have heard you talk about that. Um, my worry is that um, we rely on um, court system to tell us what kind of evidence is appropriate um, to convince the kind of court system that we have right now that there is bias. And I'm thinking that there's all kinds of other kinds of research besides um, the benchmark that um, Sheriff Clayton wants to achieve. Um, um, and I guess I want to <laughs> direct uh, my question is, um, what do we do then, since we have a community that has less trust than we would like, and you know, I don't think it's going to be served by putting more cops in the schools. What do we do? And this, I think, we'll need to go to um, Rod. Uh, what do we do about the courts? What do we do about our civil liberties? What do, what do we, we do, do about um, being able to have a voice in um, making sure that these disparities um, are addressed? Great question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. For our part, it's just a matter of approaching us when you have issues regarding injustice. So we can help, right? It all starts with a contact about a situation involving civil rights or civil liberties. And we take it from there. We get on the ground and do the work. And we follow up. Sometimes you know, we're able to build a case that warrants um, further investigation like the one in Ferndale, I just mentioned. And other times, you know, we do the work and we find out that, you know, there's you know, way more smoke than fire. Last year we got involved in a situation where um, a, a man was videotaped by an officer inside the train neighborhood. And that made it to the internet. And there was this huge outrage about police disrespecting black men throughout the Rose Point trade. And we did some investigation. We found out this was a really sad case of you know, one officer taking video of one man and we literally spent weeks in communities talking to people about their experiences. And we found out that there was racial profiling going on. There was no problem as grave as the media coverage of this one video that would appear. The good thing is, as a result of that, we worked with law enforcement in the Rose Point area who realized they needed to spend more time in community policing. Wonderful, wonderful. Next question. I'll start off by saying I'm guilty right now. <laughs> I come in here knowing that I'm guilty. So my question is for Chief Sito. I want you, you talked about raising the bar 
to a point where nobody has to feel that what happened in Ferguson can happen to them, that they're, they're, they won't end up in that circumstance. My question is, how do we make that happen? And I do need to explain a tiny bit of what underlies that. I know, and, and uh, Mr. Mont, you mentioned that in African American, that, that in communities, there are communities where there are all kinds of reasons for being angry, being upset. And you said uh, a poverty, racism. What if it's all those things, all the time? The community that I come from suffers from all those things all the time. If you're an African American person in this country, you know from a very early age that the odds are stacked against you, not simply because of bad attitudes, and, and I really greatly appreciate the things that you all are talking about in helping the, the police forces, various forces, to change the way that they think and to come to an understanding, bless Cheryl Clayton's heart, come to an understanding about their unaware, the biases that they have that are unaware, but what if the entire society is structured in such a way that it is a biased society? What are you all doing? Thank you for lifting so, that up. I don't know if you're going to be able to answer that. Well, the question, the direct question to Chief Cito is, what are you doing on the Ann Arbor Police Force to help to educate the, the uh, policemen and women to the awareness of implicit bias, personal bias, but also structural, systemic, social bias? What are you doing? I will be uh, as brief as I can. Uh, the, 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 the concern that you mentioned, I think, is a fear for all of us. You know, is this something bigger than we can fix? Is this something bigger than I myself or share can fix? And, it, and the answer is it probably is. I'll be quite honest. A couple of things that we have to do outside of the community engagement that we talked about. One of the things that I've struggled with, and I'll be very brief on this, and I still play awake, is making sure that we have diversity on the police department. I will say, I, I'm not sure we're at the level that I'm comfortable with, but that's something we strive for. I think that's one thing that will help. We start with inside. We start with our own people and have our own people share some of those uh, uh, relationships and concerns. So it's two things. One I mentioned outside, but internally I think we can strive for more, more diversity. I'll just play it out. And the beauty of all of this, this is an ongoing conversation. That's not the end of it today. <laughs> Next question. My question's for the sheriff. Um, I'm just kind of wondering about the trends in society towards increased criminalization privatization of prisons and the profit that can be made off of crime. Um, what, what, can, what can you tell me to assure me that that's not a trend here? <laughs> I can't. All I can tell you is, <clears throat> from an enforcement standpoint in the Sheriff's Office, it is not um, our objective to arrest more people, to put them in jail so they end up in prison. Uh, quite frankly, I said this all the time, I'd, I'd rather work myself out of a job. Not by not getting reelected, but by doing some of the, the root cause things that we should be doing to sort of, to, to, to hit criminal behavior, education and things of that nature. Um, what you're talking about in terms of privatizing and criminalizing certain acts is way beyond us at a local level. I will say this, in the back of the room, and I want to make sure we acknowledge this, your state rep, Adam Zimke. So, and, and, and someone that I've had conversations with about how do we do this at all levels. So it's not just the local level. It's the state level and the federal level. So I will just say this and then I'll, I will be quiet. And here's, the thing, here's another thing that struck me in first. Folks, we are responsible to a large degree about what happens in our community. So this question about why is it 70% African American in Ferguson but there are no African American elected officials, I am going to say this. I ask the folks in the African American community to also look in the mirror. It is all of our responsibility to have representative government. So you can't just point and say you're not elected, you gotta get out there and vote. So it's the same thing with all of us. If we want change, let's get out and vote, put people in place, they're gonna reflect our values. If I'm not reflecting your values, put somebody else in there. I'll just put it out there. So it's all of our responsibility to do that. No more after after the lady back back there. So let's let's do this. Ask two questions at a time. Ask two questions two questions at a time. Okay. And this, what's your question? So us two, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm I'm. I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> well, go ahead. Ask your question. Um, I live in Linden Township, outside of Chelsea. Um, the neighboring township, Waterloo Township, um, is in Jackson County and there is a police officer there who is, um, has a reserve force 
that is made of people who have a gun permit and are willing to pay a certain amount of money, might be a thousand dollars, something like that. And my question is, <laughs> is that going on in Washtenaw County now? Um, are you res using reserve officers? And if yes, what is their training and what is their role? Good question, really, really quick. We do not use our, our reserves officers in the capacity that you're talking about. We have reserves, reserve officers. They have very limited scope of what they do. They really just do traffic points and things like that. They work in conjunction with a certified law enforcement officer. They do not have to pay to be a part of that. So no, that is not going on in Washington County. Next question. First off, uh, I want to say, my name is Shirley. And uh, I've lived here in this community all my life. And um, first of all, I want to say, I'm so glad that we have this forum. I'm a little disappointed that you're hurting everybody up. Because since it's so important, you don't do that to people, and you don't cut them off, and you let them talk. Because that's the only time. Oh, you've got time limits. But if you've got time limits, then maybe you ought to do it at a time when you can expand it because it's so important. It is, it is, that's great. And I feel insulted that I have to hurry or I have to talk with somebody to get my question out because I'm not going to do it. Well, I'll, personally, I'll stay here with you all night. <laughs> <laughs> I, I they have to leave. Well, they can well, leave, well, but well, maybe we, we continue we to talk. We've made to have, have them here for a certain amount of time. So it's not to be disrespectful. We certainly understand the, the, the depth of the I'm people. just saying it is a little disrespectful. But I'll go ahead on with my question. First of all, I would like to say to the police chief, um, you have been very active in the community. And when our group, which was the Ann Arbor uh, Concerned Citizens for Justice, when we did marching last year, we went to you and you so graciously let us march. You told us how to march and what to do and we appreciated that so much. That's, that's community communication. And we followed your rules and we didn't have any problems. Of course, if you'd have locked us up, <laughs> it would have been a whole bunch of senior citizens. <laughs> but nevertheless, so I want to I want to give you a heads up for that because that's community <coughs> communication. The next thing I want to talk about is we do when we had police. And I'm glad you don't have police in the, in the schools, but when you did, you were locking kids up left and right, black kids left and right. We have the statistics. So I'm not going with your program that you have all this community input because if, if you do, it's not working and we need to work on it a little more so that we can together help these young people and not just lock them up. Mm -hmm. We need to talk more about the source of justice so that the only resolution is jail because that's not the only resolution. There's all kinds of things going on with people in their homes, Parents might be on drugs and they don't have anybody to go to. And we're not taking that into consideration. And we as a community can work together with our law enforcement to help these young people. I feel very strongly about that as a person who has lived here and has had my children and my grandchildren locked up by you. So, and sometimes unnecessarily. And the last thing I want to say to you, Sheriff Clayton, our group has asked many times to come and visit the jail, and we have not been able to visit that jail yet. So I would like to know what is the magic word so we can visit the jail. Two things. So the lady in the back facilitates many, many visits. I think you and I talked over at some group the and if you want to visit the jail, you can visit the jail. I just say we have people come to jail all the time. So 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 that's not no not to stay, not put in jail. Uh, actually 
It's the county's jail, it's not my jail. It's the county's jail, it's the people's jail. So get with Kathy and we'll set up a time for you to go to jail. And then when we do the next one of these, you can tell people, I went to the jail, oh my God, it is clean, it's secure, it's quiet. People are treated with dignity and respect because those are the same people coming back out of the community. And I will say one more piece. I don't know if you were talking about specific to Dan Arbor, I'll tell you. So in YCS, restorative justice is the practice and the protocol. That is what they're doing. And quite frankly, the sheriff's office is part of that conversation. So you're 100% right that that needs to be what we're doing. But the same way we don't want police generalizing all of us, I would ask respectfully that you not generalize all of us. Because we all don't do the same thing the same way. There are police agencies that are trying to do it the right way. And if those things are acknowledged, then they're more likely to continue and to grow. I appreciate that, but before I sit down, I didn't generalize. I gave kudos to this police chief for what he did, okay? So I didn't generalize. I'm talking about what I know and what I've been, when I have experience with my own self being locked up in your jail and with my children and grandchildren and my friend's children. So all I'm saying is, your jail is full of black folks. And there must be a reason. They ain't all criminals. And if we're using restorative justice, it isn't working yet. So that's all I'm saying, okay? Uh, good question. We have, yes, so we are, are actually testing body cams on SWAT team right now. So I've been pursuing body cams now for over a year. So we're doing a test and eval. So we've got video cameras in the cars, and we want to equip all of our staff with body cams. So we're doing a test and eval on SWAT team now, and I hope that at some point in the next 12 months, we will be able to equip everybody with body cams. Uh, they are an expensive item, uh, so we can't ignore that piece. So I can't not buy this to buy that, but it's probably going to be about um, $200,000, $250,000. But we're more than willing to do it because I want that story told. I want the story told, so we're working in that, re we're working in that, in that regard. And remember this, the technology for good body cameras is really just starting to come into the fall. So we've been studying this for a while. And we want body cameras that are going to truly capture everything. You're going to be able to have the audio as, in addition to the video, and you're going to have, be able to have access to it. So you get no argument from me there. I think the quicker we can get to that, the better for all. And so why can't we say no to some of those military items and yes to the body cams when we decide which ones they are? But we're not, we didn't, we're not buying the military items. We're not buying those. So my point is we're going to buy the cams it's got to be within our budget to do. Next question. This is for Sheriff Clayton, and it's not about militarization, but I'm always distressed over how our system keeps uh, figuring out ways to make money off people who are convicted and don't have money. And my question is, is there another way at the jail to put in cash for inmates there that is not that lovely little machine that also, of course, doesn't give all the cash to the inmate, but takes off this little piece that it keeps for itself? Uh, good question. We don't get that money. I know you don't. We don't get it. So, but and we don't, we you don't use that system. Yeah. Any system we use, and we've looked at that because I'm very sensitive to that. And we wanted to make sure that to automate that process that actually makes it easier for people to put money in inmates' account. Here's, what, here's the history. In the past, we didn't have the automated system. So the complaints I was getting from people is that I got to come all the way to the jail to give the person that I want money to give the money. I can't make it. I don't have transportation. I'm from another state. We went to this system to ease that. 
we looked everywhere. There is no system that we can employ, because those systems are in the, in the business of making money, that they're not going to attach some kind of surcharge. Quite frankly, we chose the system with the lowest surcharge. You used to just take cash, and you gave a receipt for it, and the cash went to the person there. I understand that. And the complaint we got was that for people that were having struggles to do that, couldn't make it in. So we involved. No, no, actually you can do it online. Wow. You can actually put money in the account online. So I mean, there's always going to be some reason. So we'll look at it if we need to try to do both. Yeah. Understanding the impact on, from a staffing standpoint, we'll look yeah. at that. Yeah. Thank you. Last question. Hi, I actually don't have a question. I have a comment. Um, I think that the that we have an important vote also coming up on the, in this November election, and it's about the annexation of Whitmore Lake schools. And uh, it gets back to the education question, and we know Ann Arbor has a big disparity in test results, and we've been trying to close the gap, the achievement gap, for decades? Decades. And I think that if we choose to take on another district, our attention will be further diluted, and I think Ann Arbor will, the school board and the administration will try to bring Whitmore Lake students up to the Ann Arbor level, and I think we will completely lose any momentum and any focus we have about closing that achievement gap, and I think that's really fundamental to educating our community and the students through our community schools. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I actually wanted to uh, just say, I'm Adam Zemke. I, uh, I'm one of the state reps in Washtenaw County. And I don't want to take up a lot of time, but I have a, a different uh, opinion on the annexation. I'd love to talk to anyone who is interested about it. I don't want to take up the time of the forum tonight. But if you want to talk afterwards, yeah, I will wait here as long as, as long as you want to talk. So thank you. Yep. All right. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until the killing of black men and black mothers' sons yeah. is as important as the killing of white men and white mothers' sons. And I would say that is Ella's song. And if one person has that opinion or that thought or that's on their heart in the community, then we all should not be able to rest. And this conversation has been lively, it's been wonderful. I would ask you to, if you haven't signed up, sign up and get on the contact sheet so that the next time we are able to come together and continue the conversation, there are a couple of uh, uh, additional opportunities on the back of your program. And lastly, I want to thank the organizers and everyone who put this on. Thank our guests. Thank you to them.